fitness and staff oriented uh, players uh, in the space. So what we see is, is at birth, between, uh, we, we first of all develop an intermittent infection with Pseudomonas, uh, that if untreated untreat can become a chronic infection with Pseudomonas. And so the goals of therapy are different depending on the point at which you use and, and need these therapies. If we go back to the beginning, it was Jim uh, Littlewood from Leeds, uh, who wrote the Leeds guidelines in the 80s actually, who used IV coleomycin nebulized in a cohort of patients aging anything from uh, 21 months to 14 years of age, uh, and was able to show that in these patients who'd never been exposed to inhaled antibiotics, that, that they were excellent at eradicating and or decreasing infection. And so that was where it all started. What we learned subsequently was that if you could delay the acquisition of pseudomonas, and this is why it's so important uh, in pediatrics that we continue to know the pseudomonal and microbiology status of an individual. Um, if you can delay the acquisition, you improve survival. Um, and equally, um, Stuart Elburn's group in Belfast have shown a mortality benefit uh, where we control pseudomonas. Um, I think the key paper and why when we talk about inhaled antibiotics, we always benchmark them against inhaled tobramycin was from uh, Bonnie Ramsey in Seattle. Um, and the bottom line here is to show you that in this paper, which was from the 90s, there was a 10% improvement in FEV1 in those who went on inhaled tobramycin. So this wasn't a modulator, this was an inhaled antibiotic, and it showed a sustained uh, and significant benefit uh, for those who were treated with it as a therapy. What was perhaps more important was the reduction in hospitalization, the reduction in IV antibiotics. Again, this is something uh, pre-modulator and something that we're also seeing now with with modulators. Um, and I think this is very important because for me in cystic fibrosis and for you out there as patients or caregivers in the space, uh, in truth, you do not want to exacerbate because every time you get an exacerbation, you have a 25% chance of not recovering to your pre-exacerbation state. So the mantra does need to be exacerbation zero. And so this is very important. When we think about the goals of therapy and inhaled antibiotics, we have two spaces. The first space is that of antibiotic eradication, and this is very much championed by my pediatric colleagues where serial sputums are obviously collected on patients. We know if someone develops pseudomonas and then uh, through a combination of uh, it may be oral antibiotics or an inhaled antibiotic or a combination of the two, and there are multiple different regimens, an attempt is made to eradicate this because that's obviously the key goal um, for uh, a patient is to make them pseudomonal negative. If you can't eradicate uh, um, um, or it recurs to a point that the person becomes colonized, then there is still strong data to support that if you've got pseudomonas, suppressing it is, is very important for your long-term long health. So in the space of suppressive therapies, we can look and see what's out there. And I suppose we know that there's colistin um, and there's a dry powder and a wet solution for that. We know there's tobramycin and astrinum, and these are available for people over the ages of six, which is fantastic. Um, levofloxacin is available in adults uh, because the data in pediatrics hasn't been as strong um, uh, at this point. So another option for adults. And I'm going to talk through some of this with you uh, tonight. Uh, um, uh, and that is not by any means to take from the modulators, which I will also comment on. So when we think about the modulators and we think about the journey, I mean, we went from a position in 2013 that Philip alluded to, which was the uh, uh, a rollout of Iva Kafter, where we were able to potentiate the CFTR protein. And then in the next eight years, we've got to triple therapy now where uh, we're in a situation where uh, a combination of potentiators and correctors in three drugs um, ha has resulted in, in the ability uh, to use this in so many more genotypes. So, so clearly, um, when you have inhaled antibiotics as well going on, there's so much choice now in CF 
how do we move forward? So first of all, in the modulated space or not, what we would first of all need to think about is, is, should we be using an inhaled antibiotic for a month and then be taking nothing? Or should we be doing one inhaled antibiotic alternating with another? And that's what we call CAT or continuous alternating therapies. And I suppose the important point is, is that all the studies that are done are monotherapy, month of something versus nothing month of something versus nothing. And so we don't have data out there um, in this space. Our unit, and indeed most units in, in Ireland, would be strong believers in the idea of alternate therapies, that to keep the pseudomonas suppressed at all times is a good thing. And actually, when we look at the studies that have been attempted to, to in this space, and Patrick Flume, um, in um, a recent uh, paper in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis, uh, did, uh, did the CAT study, and uh, the realities were you, they couldn't recruit patients into the study because nobody was going to go on a regimen that wasn't continuous alternate therapies. So clearly patients themselves think that this is important. Um, and in the analysis, albeit underpowered, uh, there was definitely a suggestion that if you're on an inhaled antibiotic, you're better to be on alternate ones in a continuous scenario. So uh, when we think about it, uh, uh, you know, What's the best combo? Monotherapy, dual therapy. Should we be doing three months of three different inhaled antibiotics? We really don't know at this point in time. There is no data to guide us. But there is a, an unfortunate consideration uh, for us. And this, again, predates the modulator space. And that is the question as to whether or not patients will actually use their inhaled antibiotics. And I can totally understand why people wouldn't. Uh, uh, we know the burden uh, of, of taking these, the time they can take. If you're using standard nebulized uh, uh, therapies, it can be up to an, an hour a day, which isn't easy for someone to do. Dry powder and the rapid delivery systems are quicker, but you still have to remember to do it. And it can be hard to do that. And in fact, Alexandria Quitner showed us this, uh, uh, in, in essence, prior to modulation, where in this study, she basically showed that in American CF patients, 50% of patients do 50% of their therapies 50% of the time. So clearly, um, you know, before the modulators, people weren't exactly very good at remembering to do their inhaled therapies uh, based on this data. Uh, there is a, a definite need to do them. And this was a study uh, looking at inhaled tobramycin. And what you can see here is, is that those who engage with it more than 80% of the time, in essence, are less likely to be hospitalized. So they are important. We then roll on to the journey that Philip talked about from mono to dual to triple therapy uh, and to a, to a reality now where in essence, uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, up to 90% of patients may be elig eligible for a modulator. And currently, as Philip pointed out, over two thirds of the patients in Ireland are taking them. But the, 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 the experience that we see, and I think what we need to do is, is we need to look back at our IVA CAFTER to understand where we're going with our CAF trio. Because in, in essence, monotherapy in G551D is very similar to triple therapy now, albeit the triple might be slightly better. So I think we need to look back to predict uh, the future. And what we saw in these cohorts of patients uh, uh, on monotherapy and what we're seeing now in triple therapy is less cough and less mucus, which is absolutely fantastic. We're also seeing improved energy and improved quality of life which is equally really important and an improvement in lung function. And so the problem is, is, is when you go on these drugs as an add-on to your existing therapy, this is what happens to you, uh, which is brilliant but it creates a, a dilemma for the patient. And that dilemma can go one of two ways. In a number of patients, it, uh, the feeling is I'm doing better uh, with this new therapy, therefore I'm going to stop my existing therapies. For other patients, it, it, it can be I'm doing better with this new therapy, therefore I'm going to use my existing therapies even more to ensure I do better again. And I suppose this goes back to Keith's comment about that one percent, uh, the idea, uh, because in truth, a modulator will work whether you're using your existing therapies or not. But in truth, the trials suggested uh, that they work as an add-on. And so at this point, we're at a dangerous crossroads with limited data moving forward. So when we look back, 
what happened with monotherapy? And the truth is, we looked at this in our Cork cohort. And the realities were when patients went on Ivacaptor, there was a reduction in the amount of inhaled coleomycin used by them and inhaled tobramycin. So patients were self-discontinuing or cutting back on that therapy. And that's just a fact uh, uh, as it happened. Now, the reason you're on inhaled antibiotics is because you have pseudomonas. And we know that in the non-CF bronchiectatic space where, where people are trying to get inhaled antibiotics, um, uh, the, uh, many of these patients have pseudomonas, don't get access to inhaled antibiotics and have the consequences of it. Um, so the issue is as well, on Ivacaftor, did we see a reduction in the pseudomonas? Did it go away? And, and the truth of the matter is, is whilst you might have less sputum, whilst you may not be able to give a sample as often, while sampling might not be as good, and we looked at this in our cohort, and whether you apply culture or microbiome analysis, you still have pseudomonas. So in truth, the reason for inhaled antibiotics is as anti-pseudomonal uh, therapies. And in truth, at this point in time, it is too early to suggest that triple therapy is anti-pseudomonal. Um, and certainly monotherapy wasn't based on this data and many other people's. So what will happen to inhaled antibiotics in an era of precision medicine or modulators? Well, for now, I'm suggesting to the people that are listening that we need to continue to use them. And the reason why we need to continue to use them uh, uh, and, uh, is because of the fact that at this point in time, we believe that Pseudomonas is still there. It's also extremely important as we decide, I'm not saying that in five or 10 years time, we'll continue to use them, but certainly over the next period of time, it's absolutely critical until we develop data that people stay engaged with them because we we need to maintain microbiological monitoring and this is going to become extremely difficult and why is it going to become difficult well i'll give you the example of cork we've put 66 people on calf trio every single one of them was were able to give us a sputum sample before they started calf trio so whether they were on monotherapy or dual therapy they were they were productive um, at three months only six of them are able to give us a sputum sample now. And so what's happening is, is that in the laboratories, uh, there is no sputum. And so if there is no sputum, there is no record of pseudomonas. So, so, the, so a patient is being recorded as uh, not having pseudomonas, as it were, uh, because we're not seeing it. But in truth, the realities are uh, that all we can say at this point in time is, is that we don't have the sample to confirm if you do or you don't have pseudomonas. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we can try and collect sputum. But as I said, it's technically very difficult. We can use throat swabs. But our experience with throat swabs uh, to date have been that the diagnostic yield is much lower. Induced sputum could be tried using uh, hypertonic saline. This is quite a, a, an uncomfortable procedure uh, and something uh, I think that we need to think uh, about for individuals. Uh, and then there's the issue of bronchoscopy. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about this because um, adult CF invariably, uh, you know, becomes more pediatric as time goes on. We're, we're, we're well aware of the fact that in pediatric cystic fibrosis, patients often need bronchoscopy to determine if they do or they don't have pseudomonas. Whereas in adults previously who are productive, uh, we were in a position to be able to tell. Uh, I think we're now in a space uh, where many patients are not productive, um, but were previously positive based on their sputums. And I suppose one of the things that we're looking at at, at Cork University Hospital is engaging with our patients after a year of triple therapy and offering those that are consenting to undergo bronchoscopy. Our, our approach here is to adopt a pediatric approach in essence. We will use disposable bronchoscopes. So these are bronchoscopes that cannot be contaminated in any way because they've never been used on anyone else before. And the idea is to lavage patients at 12 months to see if you're still pseudomonal positive or not. And I think that's very important. And until we have data like this from a number of centers, the idea of, 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 of de-engaging from your inhaled antibiotics uh, is one that, that you're doing without any strong data to say that it's the right thing to do. So hopefully um, over the coming 12 to 24 months, we'll be able to share some of this uh, with you. That said, 
I also think it's important to recognize that people have busy lives. And so I thought I'd give you a whistle stop tour of inhaled antibiotics. Um, and, and around that, I just want to, 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 to kind of talk through a lot of them and I'll, I'll blitz through the, these in the interest of time because there are multiple different ways of taking antibiotics. Um, and, uh, uh, and there are inhaled antibiotics that previously people may not have tolerated that they might do now. And so just to give people an idea of the space. So you've got four drugs, as it were, um, if you're an adult, three if you're a child, so tobramycin, estrenum, and coleomycin for kids. Levo has an additional uh, license in adults. You can use standard nebulizers, which take a lot of time, and so that's a big commitment. E-flow devices, which are quicker. Dry powder devices, which are probably quicker again, but often associated with cough, but it depends on the individual. So clearly, we can individualize inhaled antibiotics in a personalized medicine approach moving forward. And I think we need to do that. So is quicker better? I think really that's down to the individual. We looked at this originally um, around tobramycin um, because the reason the dry powder really got licensed was the fact that uh, people loved it. Uh, they found that the convenience of it was great. Um, and when we rolled it out at Cork University Hospital, initially, most of our patients transitioned to it and found it excellent. But it was, it was interesting that over time, many people went back to the wet solution, that they found it somewhat irritating. So I think really there's two options. Um, and either uh, have a role. Astrianum uh, is another inhaled antibiotic, anti pseudomonal, which is excellent. Uh, again, we've used this and we've shown it to be highly effective. In a real world study involving multiple centers in Ireland and the UK, we showed that it could actually improve lung function um, in, in patients who are rapidly declining, which was not what it was in essence licensed for, and it's very well tolerated. But the problem with it is you have to do it three times in 24 hours. Now, it doesn't have to be eight hourly, but it is three times. And the, the, the truth of the matter is the data shows it doesn't work if you use it twice. So I suppose, in essence, it's not for everybody. But still, uh, it's a rapid device, so about five to ten minutes to do, but it would take a commitment of three times a day. Coleomycin is the third one I want to talk about. And, and again, just around the dry powder uh, uh, device, I suppose the key issue was the turbo spin device. Everyone loved it, loved the delivery system. And so it, that's where it got its license um, around convenience. But it was very interesting that when it came out initially, this was data from Manchester. And basically almost half of the people who tried uh, coleomycin originally, and this would be like four or five years ago now, actually actually stopped using it in Manchester. And just to let you know, that was a capsular issue uh, um, with the coleomycin that has since been resolved. And so that's very important because there may be people out there who tried colobreathe in the past, uh, didn't uh, tolerate it, but in fact, the preparation has been changed now. So it might be useful to engage with again, and it's a very quick uh, device. Finally, there's levofloxacin. And I'm just going to spend a small little bit more time on that because it's new. And so people may not know, know as much about it. It's an, an inhaled antibiotic. Uh, it's given in an e-flow device. Its advantages is it's twice daily. So that's, that's, that's a differentiator from astrianum, which is a good thing. It's equivalent to tobramycin. That's also a good thing. The bad thing about it, though, is that um, about 25% of patients will describe an awful taste in their mouth. And as one patient of ours said, it's like chewing antibiotics. So this is an issue that you have to know about um, if you're going to take it. But there are ways around that. The the other two concerns are um, a little bit like ciprofloxacillin. It can be associated with tendinitis and costochondritis, albeit rarely, uh, but it does exist. So it's not for everybody. Now, the real world concerns were around taste and tendinopathy and where would it fit? So in Cork, I, we've used quite a bit of it. And so I just wanted to share some of our own data because uh, as uh, Keith knows, um, any Cork person, you know, uh, will always want to share what we're doing down here with everybody else. I'm sorry, it's just genetic. But anyway, in the background, we've 197 patients in our unit, 179 pre-lung transplant, 122 uninhaled antibiotics. We see wet to dry coleomycin Mycin is a 50-50 split, wet to dry tobramycin, more wet actually than dry, a 60-40, astrianum obviously is all wet, but we actually have 
29 patients, so about one in five, using levofloxacin. But why do they use it? They like the e-flow, they like that it's wet, um, and uh, they don't like doing something three times a day. So that, 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 that's fairly logical. One person, as I said, discontinued because of taste, uh, which is totally understandable as well, uh, but you can counsel on taste. And what we've noticed, and again, I thank one of our, our patients for this, is, is that if you, after taking it, uh, use chocolate, but it has to have 70% cocoa, it actually eradicates that aftertaste. Um, so it can be overcome with a square of 70% cocoa chocolate. So the other interesting thing is, is since the rollout of modulators, um, uh, how much inhaled antibiotic have we been prescribing? And I'll come back to that just, but, but just beforehand, when we do initiate it, we are worried about tendinopathy. So we do say to patients, don't go weightlifting for the first month you're on it um, or and avoid high impact sports. We did see uh, tendinitis in one patient, but in fact, they had been taking ciprofloxacin at the same time, which you shouldn't do ideally. Uh, so just don't use Cipro if you're on Levo. Um, and the two patients had, had sunburn. Now, I don't know whether that was the drug or whether it was the fact that we were lucky that we had two days sunshine and understandably people went out in the sun. But these are things to consider. What's interesting, though, is, is we have had one new inhaled antibiotic started in a patient since the rollout of modulators, as in the uh, patients are coming, they're obviously better, we're not thinking about changing their inhaled therapies and they're not needing uh, new inhaled therapies, whether they're taking them or not is another question. Um, and I suppose um, uh, we've only prescribed it in one person and this was a person using dual therapy. So how should we protect the lung in an era of uh, precision medicine and CFTR modulators. I think in the short term, we need to continue to encourage people to use inhaled antibiotics. I do not think there is data that shows that Pseudomonas has been eradicated yet. And so for now, in the first year or two of learning about uh, this amazing drug, Caftrio, I would be encouraging everybody to stay on it. Uh, in the form of an inhaled antibiotic. That said, I think it's reasonable for people to have a more individualized approach to their inhaled antibiotics and maybe be aware of the different delivery systems, the different choices, um, uh, as it were, and maybe re-engage with colo breathe again or, or not to try and get something that is more in keeping uh, with, the, with the increased liberation that CAF-TRIO has offered our, our patients. It is critical that we learn about the microbiology of the CF lung post-modulation. It is absolutely vital. Just because you can't get a sputum does not mean you don't have a bacterial infection. And so uh, for now, I, I think we have to wait and see. Uh, briefly, what are the mucolytics? And again, what you can see here is, is there's pulmazyme and the early studies again showed a 10% improvement um, or, um, in um, in lung function uh, with pulmazyme. So, you know, that, that, that was also pre-modulation. Hypertonic saline showed an improvement and a decrease in exacerbation. So where will we be with inhaled mucolytics? I think the answer for that will come sooner. And, uh, uh, and the reason why is two things. There are two studies going on at the moment called Simplify and Storm. And these are a US and a UK study. And people can follow these online if they're interested. And they are basically randomized studies that are going to have patients actively disengage from their inhaled uh, um, uh, hypertonic saline and see what happens to their lung function over time. So I, I do think uh, we will see it. That said, my own personal belief is, is that the mucolytics may not be as necessary moving forward. And why do I say that? I say that because the first study, Strive, um, when we used uh, Ivacaptor, uh, patients couldn't be on hypertonic saline uh, at the time of that study, and we still saw the significant lung improvements. And the other reason why I would say it is, is data from low-dose high-res CT scanning is showing a radical decrease in mucus post-modulator. So I, I think the, the mucolytics uh, may be something that we will very quickly be able to answer for people, uh, but I'm not as uh, convinced uh, in the space of inhaled antibiotics if we want a person to have the best possible outcome. And this goes back to what Keith is saying. I mean, clearly these drugs modulators work, but in reality, they probably work better 
if you're on your inhaled therapies also. And that is just a fact. So we also need to find new markers to apply our, our decision making. Because in reality, people's lung function is now being preserved. So how do we monitor it? Um, we need additional tools to support this. And around that, I think low-dose high-res CT scanning is going to become critical. Uh, we have a program here with Professor Maher in that space, uh, which has been highly useful uh, for the, 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 both the adults and the kids with CF at Cork. And we need to roll this kind of uh, protocol out. MRI may have promise, uh, but I think it's, it's much harder to standardize that. And I think we're a few years from seeing that as being a real day-to-day -to -day tool. I think we also uh, need to engage with uh, LCI, which is uh, a lung clearance index. We've been doing it for years in pediatrics, but I think now the adults will be suitable because the lung function won't be going down. Uh, to look at LCI as a, as a monitor of lung function, we need to be novel and think about Fitbits and things uh, that monitor activity. But again, I suppose for me, I think we may be entering into a space of where we may need to look at disposable bronchoscopy as a tool in the adult ar arena to follow you microbiologically periodically if we want to give you the best outcome that we possibly can. So uh, I'd just like to thank CFI. I'd like to thank them for all their support on an ongoing basis. And I'd also like to thank my own team here at Cork University Hospital. Uh, and I suppose I've highlighted, uh, you know, our, our, I should have highlighted everybody, uh, but uh, I, I'd just like to say that uh, without my, the CF nurses and physios and dietitians, um, my life would be uh, hell. So I'd just like to thank them for everything that they do for, uh, for me and obviously for all the patients uh, in the greater Cork area with cystic fibrosis. Thanks again, Keith. You're most welcome. Are, are, are Claire, Murray, James and Claire your favourites? You wanted to highlight uh, them as well, I have getting no, extra I thanks. Have no, that I have involved. no favourites. I have no favourites, but, um, no. but I, I suppose in the front line on a day-to-day -day basis, um, people will know when you ring the phone, the probability is it'll be Claire, Maraid, or James will answer it. Um, uh, so in, in truth, I, 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 I want to acknowledge everybody. Uh, yes. uh, we're a small, tight-knit group, uh, but I'd be lost without them. Oh, fabulous. This is really great. Uh, I know we've got a couple of minutes of questions, uh, Barry, yeah, or one or two that have, that have come in. I just I took a couple of notes and I've learned a huge amount. Uh, so, some of the statistics are outstanding, obviously, uh, that you've shared. The, the one that's today for me is, is the fact that 50% of the patients do 50% of the therapies 50% of the time. It reminded me of our dear friend, Ron Burgundy, in a, in a, in a famous movie, Anchorman, who talked about his aftershave being effective, what was it, 60% of the time, all of the time. So I think we need to just make sure that people are actually participating in their in their in their uh, in their treatment protocols as best as they can be and it's great to hear you talk about the continued investment in what has worked thus far and not let's get complacent now for the time being whilst we're in a place of of strength and we're in a place of using these modulator drugs were really really beneficial to be able to actually do so i i, um, I just like to say i mean for me on a on a day-to-day -day basis uh, you know, if if someone, I, I think, you know, you know, in the real world, I mean, you obviously want people to do it a hundred percent of the time. Mm. You know, but no one does everything a hundred percent of the time. I mean, none of us do. No. But I suppose the realities are all the studies, all the data show there is a massive difference yeah. in, in adherence rates of eighty percent or higher nice. versus less. Yeah. And so it, this gets back to your point. If everyone is roughly around if fifty percent or around fifty, how can we get eighty yeah. percent to eighty? To strive it up a bit better, yeah. No, no absolutely. And, and the other thing I wrote down is I, I, I know you were also being nice. I reckon the two people that got sunburned were drinking cans of boomers in their back garden. I don't know if it's something to do with uh, the fact that it was the truck, but I'm just being cynical. The well, question that, they're that came patients, in from... So they normally drink microbrewery expensive... Oh, microbrewery is exp expensive homebrew stuff. Yeah, that are squashed by someone's socks or something like that. Yeah. Um, is there a no, risk, no. Uh, is there a risk, Barry, of... Uh, one of the questions coming in from um, from the audience, is there a risk of becoming resistant to the NEB nebulized antibiotics? For example, when you haven't had an infection over a number of years and you have been on the modulator. Oh, so it's oh, a question that's coming that's in. That's a really ask brilliant you. question. And, and the reason why it is actually is, first of all, um, inhaled antibiotics and your microbiological report really don't reflect each other. So resistance 
uh, as, as the way the microbiologists determine it, um, is based on if you were to give a drug intravenously or as a tablet. The truth of the matter is, is the concentrations that you give inhaled antibiotics at are a, about a thousand times the concentration you can give it orally or as an injection because it's just not safe. So in reality, you know, using these therapies on an ongoing basis, month on, month off, um, is highly effective and the development of resistance really isn't an issue. You, 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 you couldn't become resistant to it almost as an inhaled therapy because the dose we can deliver is so high. So, so, so. Uh, good I, I good to hear. The, yeah. the only other one that's just uh, come in is there hasn't been any recent research on inhaled therapies for Burkholderia capacia. Um, and brilliant, has, has another been. brilliant question. I mean, um, unfortunately for Capacia, uh, the, there's very limited data out there. Um, there was a lot of excitement around pot potentially a strianum uh, having a role in Capacia. And there was a trial done by Gilead in that space. But unfortunately, because of the unmet need of that trial, uh, and I say that in the nicest way possible, it was open to everybody. And so the trial studied people with brilliant lung function, mm. average lung function, and really poor lung function. Mm. And so they never really were able to describe whether there was a signal or not. There was a sense that there might be a signal, but it wasn't ever proven. Um, but uh, certainly lots of us would, would try a strianum as an option. Again, there's a small study from the Brompton group in the past using nebulized keftazidine. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, that study was very small, uh, but people still use it. But it is definitely a space there where there is an unmet need. I'd agree with you, Keith. Uh, how do we uh, optimize inhaled antibiotics for people with depression? Thank you so much for answering. Um, just wanted to see if there's any other questions that have come in. I'll just double check uh, with our hosts. Um, do, 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 do. No, I don't think there are any that have come in quite now yet. But listen, uh, very uh, fascinating to listen, listen to you as ever. Um, I love the way you put the cork spin um, with, with cork and outside of cork on things, but cork is a massively important factor in any subset of groups where you have passionate professors, passionate teams who want to continue to invest in research. It's paramount for us to continue to learn and continue to build on this. And, and that's something that we know has come through strongly from you and from your team and, and from everybody involved. That's something that really, to me, having only been involved the last number of years, it's fascinating to see that people want to continue to strive for, for these improvements. I wrote down six people having started on the modulator out of your 66 can only provide a sputum. I think when we hear these types of statistics, these are great things to continue to see that hopefully they're working and will continue to work. Um, simplify and storm studies. Great to hear how that might progress over over the next while um, for continued disengagement from um, from different types of treatments. But overall, I think there's been probably a fascinating uh, audience listening to you, Barry. And thanks so much for taking up time on your Wednesday evening. And uh, yeah, you want to say something else? So the, just the one thing, because the audience is really the the key stakeholders. Uh, and I don't, as I said, I don't want to be Ferris Bueller's teacher, you know, but I just think that the smartest thing to do at the moment is if you engage with modulators, engage with them as an add-on and mm -hmm. at least see how you go for the first 12 months. See how good you can be before you decide to self discontinue something else nice. i totally yeah. understand why you would do it but yeah. i just think give the units the chance to learn about what you're like in this new modulated space before yeah. maybe altering how good you might be and i suppose that's that, that that was kind of what i had said to philip was one of my calls out today and i do genuinely believe there will be data and with that data then people will be in a position to make an informed decision. It might be a decision that we wouldn't agree with, but an informed one based uh, on what their microbiology is like and what Simplify and what um, Storm yep. shows. One last, one, la one last question, yep. Barry, that's just come in actually, which is uh, worth, worth asking, should every person with CF be on some form of an inhaled antibiotic as a preventative for pseudo or otherwise, or Very is good. it just prescribed no. for somebody that no, has had no. a confirmed um, the, case? The, 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 
Absolutely fantastic question again. Um, I, uh, I mean, it's been extensively studied um, and uh, there is really no advantage to being on inhaled an antibiotics if you don't have Pseudomonas. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the issue here uh, really uh, is your, your, because they won't do anything if you get me. Yeah. Uh, you, you, they have nothing to target. And all you're doing then is, is, is giving someone something that they have to do every day that isn't going to yeah. actually change what's going to happen. That said, I think the point is for those who are not needing inhaled antibiotics, the key for those individuals, and thankfully they're an increasing number, the number of patients now that are adult and pseudomonal negative relative to 20 years ago is much higher. Um, knowing your microbiology is critical moving forward because if you acquire pseudomonas um, and you don't have an eradication mm. uh, of it and it becomes embedded in your lung and then you have a chronic infection that may change the long-term course of your illness so so if you're one of the lucky ones and there's lots of them out there now you know it is critical that we still get a sputum or a throat swab or a bronchoscopy, depending. I mean, I, clearly I'm pushing uh, uh, something now, but the advent of disposable bronchoscopy um, uh, devices really offers us a safe way of sampling uh, mm. for many now. So I, I really think, yeah, don't use them unless unless your microbiology is positive. Nice, nice, good. Um, super. Um, I'm not sure, Philip, if you have any other questions your side or your... your... You're happy, put you on the spot there. Uh, yeah, no, just, uh, I suppose, just, I know there's some comments about the, that not everybody um, benefits from these wonderful new modulators. And the, I think we should acknowledge that. And Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It, it just uh, your sense of having to adjust doses, uh, Barry, in terms of responding to somebody's reactions, uh, you know, is is that an, an issue? Maybe to decrease the doses of... Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I, well... I don't want to bias the 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 the, the rollout of the Captrio program um, um, in, in any shape or form. Oh, um, absolutely. Uh, so I, I suppose two things. First of all, um, you're absolutely right. I think if you're not modulated, uh, and I suppose if if I didn't say that properly, if you're not fortunate enough that you're eligible for a modulator, and we there are a substantial, significant number of people in that space. Um, clearly for you, your inhaled antibiotics are even more important and your mucolytics because, and I think you need to remember that those drugs have shown an improvement of 10% uh, when they were used. So they are good and they do work. So staying engaged with them and I suppose staying as well as you can until somebody does find a modulator for you in the future is the goal. And I think, uh, I know, but I acknowledge uh, that comment. Uh, I think the issue around dose adjustment um, uh, certainly, certainly there has been, you know, a, a, a sense in the CF community that up to 10% of people are finding, um, you know, the, the, the full dose uh, uh, CAF trio difficult to tolerate um, initially, which wasn't seen in the trials. The reasons for that are complex, as the patients have reported anxiety, brain fog, as you know, I mean, the, the blogging sites are saying it. Um, uh, we know from the phase two studies that uh, lower doses of these drugs uh, were effective, whether they're as effective as full dose therapy um, is another question. Um, uh, um, uh, I suppose our, our approach for patients who are in this space, and we have about 10 of them, uh, have been to, 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 to adopt a dose reduction. So we reduce to one tablet a day initially, and then we add in the Ivacaftor in after six weeks, uh, and then we potentially dose escalate back over three months. So we, we start slower and dose up if possible, and we will follow these people with sweat chlorides and low dose CT scans. Um, but the point that we don't know yet is, is by doing this, we may well alleviate those symptoms. Are we modulating them as well as the full dose? Maybe we're not, but maybe we can't, you know, and maybe 75% modulation is better than nothing. Uh, but I suppose we have a substantive cohort that we're following and we hope to share that at European CF uh, around our experiences uh, in that space. And I know others are doing the same. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, even if you can tolerate the full dose, there are ways in the short term where you could where where your unit could look at 
at trying to, um, you know, monitor you, albeit accepting that you may not be getting uh, as full a, an effect. But our initial uh, data would suggest that many patients on lower doses uh, will tolerate uh, and be effective, uh, albeit it may not be, you might be getting 10% rather than 14%, Philip, if you get me, and time will tell. Thanks, Barry. The last thing I'd say about that, though, is, is that could have been compounded somewhat by the COVID pandemic, yeah. because I think I think we have to acknowledge <clears throat> with cystic fibrosis have been put through an awful lot. Um, and so we rolled out a drug in the middle of a pandemic. So the combination of those two things could contribute to someone feeling nervous and anxious. And that's only human. So I think time will tell. Good point. Yeah, very good. And um, yeah, thanks for sharing because I think everything that we're saying, it's compounding the focus that we need to do and continue to strive. I uh, think like you mentioned before, individualizing the approach and individualizing the treatment, listening to yourself, listening to your practitioners. It's all really part and parcel of how we continue to evolve. So I really appreciate your feedback on this one. Um, last comment I'd say is everyone loves a turbo spin in Manchester was one of the things I wrote down I don't even know what a turbo spin is Barry but that's what I wrote no, it's the cola breathe one of my last one of my last it's a turbo spin is the cola breathe delivery system and so maybe initially they did well they didn't love it at the start because they had a manuscript um, at European CF back in 2016 where within a year 45% of them had stopped it but the, yeah. I, 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 why I was highlighting that is... It sounded like a 1950s workout video or something when yeah, I was well, listening to you talking well, about I, it. I, I think the, the, the important point about that is, is there may be patients or family members watching tonight and say, oh, we tried that inhaled antibiotic five years ago. It's different. <laughs> the point is, is they have modulated the capsule. And, I, and, yeah. and since and so that in Manchester data validated actually that at that time in Manchester, not everybody loved the turbo spin. Loved the turbo maybe spin. Now, yeah. Maybe they do now. Maybe they do now. Maybe and they it, do, or it's a different type of turbo. Spin, maybe it's a different type of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, something yeah. to do with Oasis, perhaps. <laughs> there you go. Bring it back to rock and roll. Uh, nice. Well, listen. Thank you so much, Barry. A pleasure as always. Um, as thank I said, you very it's much. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and to part no, it, it, it's it's great, and and the engagement with the audience is obviously really great to see that people are really continued uh, continued interest in in how we continue to evolve. So ple pleasure having you. Um, in terms of what we've got next for the conference this evening, so we've run just a couple of minutes over. Thanks, Barry. Take care. God bless. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye.